I'm a world builder at heart. I've spent the better part of my life tinkering with fictional places, societies, cultures, characters, and creatures. One of my earliest memories of creating was when I was eight years old, and it got into my head that I was one of the last people left on Earth. My parents had, perhaps unwisely, let me stay up late on a school night to watch The Matrix, and I got it in my head that aliens in cybernetic beetle suits had destroyed the world, taking me as, perhaps, their only survivor, <laughs> to be placed in a simulation of my previous life so they could study us humans in our natural habitat. I thought that the world around me was a replica, a simulation made by them, and I spent a long time thinking about what they were like physiologically, psychologically, culturally. World building like this became my primary hobby from a young age, not necessarily with the end goal of sharing it with anyone. For me, it was the act of creating that I enjoyed. I was never going to be a world building Beethoven. I was much more the type to be a nameless, barely paid jazz improv pianist in a lonely nighttime bar somewhere in Southside Chicago. Dungeons and Dragons turned out to be the perfect hobby for me, a great way to share my world building with others and tell stories collaboratively. Magic the Gathering, another dear hobby of mine, is an intellectual powerhouse when it comes to pumping out excellently built world after world after world. I hungrily devoured the flavor on the cards the philosophy of the color system, and the lore of the now discontinued series of weekly story updates, and I used it all to embolden and empower the worlds I'd create. I loved it enough to create a YouTube channel dedicated to the concept. Ikoria, soon to be released, has come out with a mixed reception. Most are at least a little excited, and some feel lied to. This layer of Behemoths is less Magic's takes on Godzilla and more its take on how to train your dragon. But all that's neither here nor there. To be honest with you, I love Ikoria. I haven't been as excited about a world like this for some time. If you're of like mind, then this video might show you some cool things you didn't already know. And if you remain unconvinced by Ikoria, hopefully I can open your heart to one of the most heartfelt pieces of fantasy world building ever done by Wizards of the Coast by anybody. The color pie is baked into the heart of Agoria, from the ground up. As a world builder, it's beautiful to see how such a formal, rigid structure can be used to create organic, living and breathing spaces. Agoria is split up into five triumphs, each of which lean heavily on three of Magic's five colors. Each color has a characteristic landscape, and Savai, for example, is a triumph where you mix reds and mountains with white plains and blacks swamps. Savai is a cracked plain of arid grasslands with branching cave networks lying under the surface. Prides of big cats hunt across the steppes, while the tunnels and trenches below the grassy surface provide cover for humans and other prey species. Immediately that's so evocative and offers an interesting choice for the players in your game or the characters in your world. Do they risk it with the top cats on the surface, or trudge through trenches with the bottom of the food chain? That's one of the things that makes Aquaria such a massive smash hit for me, the integration of monsters into the natural environment. Too often, in Dungeons & Dragons, the beasties are disconnected from place in a way that seems unnatural and hollow. Here the monsters serve to elevate the place, as the place serves to elevate the monsters. Another massive success of Aquaria for me is the integration of mythos into location. Each triumph has an apex predator, a monster so famed and feared that there's a rich tradition that sprouted up around it. Not only is the dinosaur cat nightmare that rules Savai, Snapdax, worked into the geography, but he's worked into the culture. The city of Dranath here has an origin myth that revolves around people from other settlements shattered by Snapdax coming together. And let's look at Dranath. A massive walled city constantly on guard for Okoria's monsters. They incorporate green crystals that glow when monsters are near into the buildings and into the military uniforms. That origin as refugees from homes shattered by monsters means that the distrust for beasts is deeply rooted in Dranath culture. Nothing in Ikoria is disconnected. There's a wonderful fluidity to it all. It all bleeds into itself. But for our purposes, you'll find that each triumph can be modularly slotted in and out of any world you'd like to be building. If Savai calls to you, you don't need to start a new game set in Ikoria. 
You can take this beautiful region and slap it wherever you like in your world, and your players get to encounter an evocative landscape full of thematic monsters. Most beasties in the game could be your flavor to be cats, with minimal fuss, and for our take on Snapdeck, their self, consult the downloadable PDF with all five Apex Predators statted up in the comments. But there's more to Ikoria than Savoy. I want this video to be as tight as possible, but I'd be remiss if I left out the spectacular work done on the other Triumphs, each of which, I remind you, can be used modularly, dropping them in and out however you choose. Ketria is the result of mixing Red's Mountains with Green's Forests and Blue's Islands, described as rivers and waterfalls that wind through crystalline forests and cascade down mountainsides. Ketria is a space dominated by elementals, which inhabit the space with sublime ease. Powered by Akoria's strange mutation driving crystals, elementals are often examples of these crystals taking real, tangible form, I mean sprouting legs and walking around like they own the place. From a literal quartz wood, or crystal and tree intermingle, to the impossibly large Lake Tile, fed by the Tile River, which is itself pocketed by pools created by the footsteps of previous powerful behemoths, and each of those pools is teeming with crystalline fish life, Ketri is this beautiful interconnected place of magical abundance and hidden danger. The apex of this triome is the mercurial and mysterious Eluna, a powerful elemental beast dinosaur who plucks dreams from the heads of mortals and makes them into reality. The people of Ketria have this seldom seen danger as a key piece of their folklore, where the stories of what wonders and horrors Eluna conjures change every time they're told, just as how the monsters that spend too much time near Ketria's crystals might suddenly find their biology shift to accommodate new and fearsome features. Spookier still is Indatha, a triumph that is a perfect mix of White's Plains with Green's Forests and Black's Swamps. Described as a stretch of low hills and mysterious lowlands, lit by eerie, luminous creatures, the helica trees and the chilly frondlands are said to draw in travellers, which in turn feed the region's fearsome nightmares. Indeed, Indatha has little cover and very clear sightlines, which accentuate the horror of the Triumph's naturally occurring nightmares quite nicely. Several of these species are bioluminescent, meaning the place is eerily bright even by night. There's a perverse, twisted beauty to the whole thing, as if it were all a carefully crafted anglerfish trap. The apex of this place is Nethroi, the Death Dweller. Again, Nethroi is a big part of Indatha's culture. Legends tell of Nethroi's ghostly whispers. He carries the souls of those who fall within Indatha with him, even as their corpses lurch after the living who dare tread in this space. Any enemy felled in Indatha should be burned or otherwise dealt with immediately, as you never know when Nethroi's ghostly and ghastly influence might cause your enemies to rise up against you once more. But lest you think Indatha is too bleak, the whimsical and wonderful Sky Sail can be found here. A disparate city of floating hot air balloons, Sky Sail is a wonderful inclusion in any D&D campaign, Indatha in tow or no. The floor of the makeshift city being made from the lightest wood and pterodactyl bone. Not only is it high above most threats, but if attacked by a large airborne predator, it can detach and scatter at will to regroup elsewhere when the threat's been diverted. <laughs> Though I wish that Sky Sail could have been more prevalent on cards, it is one of my favorite pieces of lore in the whole of Akoria. Imagine the wonder you can strike into the hearts of your players when they're standing on a city of floating skyships. Imagine the fear when the klaxons sound and a monster strikes so the city disperses beneath their feet. Next is Rogren, where Blue's Islands meet Red's Mountains and White's Plains. You get a rim of volcanic peaks overlooking a coast spotted with white sand beaches. What dominates Rogren? Dinosaurs, of course. The coastline of Rogren grows as lava flows into the coast to make more land, which dinosaurs like to colonize as quickly as they can, and these beasties also incubate their eggs by placing them next to the peaks of Rogren's active volcanoes, which is another one of my favorite details of the entire plane. Really, the incorporation of monsters and geography into one fluid package is not easy, and Ikoria nails it 5 out of 5 times. The apex of this space is Vadrok, a fire-infused dinosaur that is constantly on the hunt. He's the hungriest, hungriest hippo, and he's been unshackled from any children's board game. 
Vadrock is again a big part of Ragrin's mythology. Their city, the Lava Brink, is in such a hilarious, inhospitable place because Vadrock reduces any other settlements they try to build elsewhere to ash. Even with living in an active volcano, sometimes the humans of Lava Brink are still bothered by dinosaurs, so they train lava monsters to sling molten rock at these beasts to ward them off. The people here embrace danger to avoid danger, and I love that. I also love how the people of Lava Brink are famed forgers and smiths because they have this great access to incredible heat. Again, Lava Brink isn't on many cards, and that's a shame, but that just makes me more and more likely to include it in all my campaigns from here on in because it deserves more attention. Lastly, and not at all leastly, is Zagoth. Teeming rainforests with vast lily pools and swampy wetlands, Zagoth is what happens when Black's swamps meet Green's forests and Blue's islands. It's fungal, it's wet, it's dark, it's alive. The sturdy forests root deep in muck and are home to equally dirty and sturdy beasts. These large, mostly herbivorous mammals are often preyed upon by humans for their tusks, their fur, and their meat. Zagoth, you see, holds one of the real tragedies of Ikoria. Humans are so used to being hunted and hating monsters, but the beasts of Zagath are mostly friendly and kind, if a little unaware of their own strength. They respond gratefully to offerings of food, but unscrupulous humans use this to bait their traps and hunt the peaceful beasts here for sport and profit. Apex means something different in this gentle, vegetarian place. Brokos, the forever beast, is at the top because he's lived the longest. It's described as an immovable object, Brokos is slow to start and impossible to stop. The myth of Brokos showcases a human who tried to slay the beast in the distant past. He responded not with revenge, but kindness, showing her visions of the past and future, so she could lead her people peacefully and with grace. This is one triumph where the myth isn't heeded by the surrounding people, most of whom are only there for easy pickings anyway. And there we have it five absolutely fantastic pieces of world building, each of which is ready made to be dropped into your world should you like it. Again, thanks to my friend John for giving us these beautiful stat blocks that you can download so your players can be hunted or hunt the five powerful apexes. But Akoria is more than the sum of these parts. No, for me, what takes the metaphorical cake is bonders. In Ikoria, most humans despise monsters, but some form an inexplicable, emotional, almost mystical connection with a monster that leads them to be firm friends, mostly forever. This is why Ikoria feels to some less like a kaiju place, and more like a place riffing on Pokemon. These bonders and their friendships with monsters is a central part of the feel of Ikoria, and it makes it feel like a very complete world emotionally. Not only do you have humans against monsters, you have interspecies cooperation too, which is showcased beautifully on cards like Stronger Together, and some others I'll show here. And this is something I think every D&D campaign could use a little bit of, not just a full integration of monsters your players encounter into the wider world, as showcased in the Triumphs, but into the characters they meet themselves. Once you open your heart to this idea, you'll find your DM brain brimming with all sorts of exciting character ideas. Just off the top of my head, a, a young illusionist girl who's bonded to a baby hydra, which she pretends is a frog so she can still go into towns and cities. Um, a human boy bonded to one of the goblins who kidnapped him <laughs> with intention to eat him alive. Uh, a captain of the guard for like a local village or hamlet who uh, fights with the griffin that bonded to her, and they, the two of them keep people safe from other monsters. Or, I mean, those are all quite nice. Uh, what about a scheming businessman who bonds with a hideous beholder and they join in some sort of evil partnership? This kind of human touch is what gives Ikoria its electric humanity. And I think any D&D campaign could really be improved with the addition of this feature. If you wanted it to be really important to the campaign, you could introduce a sort of system of having your players potentially become bonders. You could even roll a d100 at the start of every initiative, where the players encounter at least one monster. And if the die rolls a 100, congratulations, a random monster bonds to a random player. Or maybe bonds to the party as a whole, you're, and you're in charge here. Just use the Beastmaster rules, um, with the beast being replaced by whatever monster your party was up against. Was it a bugbear? An illithid? A baby dragon? Do your players even want the creature on their team? And how is the world going to react to it? A bonding instantly redefines your campaign for the, in your player's mind. <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone wants that kind of nonsense, right? I mean, we all played a lot of D&D campaigns, but a D&D campaign where you bonded with 
say, a beholder, and it became a special friend of yours that you had for the rest of the campaign. That's just exciting. I'm excited. Can you tell <laughs> that I'm excited? I love every breath of flavor on Ikoria. And hopefully now you've got a good sense of what about it excites you and how you can put it into practice. <laughs> What's your favorite part of this crazy plane? Let us know below because we read every comment. A special thanks to Chris Mooney for the Planeswalker's Guide to Ikoria article, which I leaned on very heavily in the writing of this script. It's a little unclear to me if Chris wrote the article, and if not, many thanks to whoever on the creative team did, or if it was a group effort to all of you. Thanks to everyone who's engaged with our videos so far. It's incredible how much you guys are watching and commenting and liking. Uh, feel free to hang out with us on our Discord. If you're watching the videos, then we care about what you have to say. And we're already having a bunch of fun in there with the people who are in. Uh, yeah, I've been Connor, and this has been Building Better Dungeons. Peace.